Okay, hello and welcome back. So as promised, we're gonna talk about how <coughs> various systems coordinate with each other. So um, due to the compartmentalization of functions in a multicellular animal, um, <coughs> we need some way for systems to communicate with each other. And there are two systems that are primarily responsible for this communication, the endocrine system and the nervous system. So the endocrine system, um, which is what? Let me get my pointer. So here's the endocrine system here. So in the endocrine system, um, we have chemical signal, mo signaling molecules such as hormones being sent into the bloodstream. And so they're gonna be transmitted to the whole body. Now, typically the way this works is that you have to have the right receptor for that particular hormone. In other words, it's kind of analogous to, you know, a radio transmission is just sent everywhere, but you have to have the right, be tuned into the right station to actually pick it up. But it is sort of this large scale transmission. By contrast, in the nervous system, cells are transmitting nerve impulses to two very specific locations, you know, coming in from, you know, we get some kind of stimulus that is transmitted as a nerve impulse to a very specific location. <clears throat> so the endocrine system, let's bounce back to endocrine for a second, um, secretes hormones. Those are those little chemical messengers. And these secreted chemicals are gonna travel um, to a target cell and you are a target cell if you have the right receptor for that particular hormone. And this will somehow change the cell's function usually through a signal transduction pathway which you learned about in 1406. Now these are relatively slow acting because we have to secrete this molecule, it's gotta travel through the bloodstream, it's gotta find the right cells that have the right receptor, the cell has to respond to that, that signal but typically they're pretty long lasting. Now in the nervous system, it's a very kind of different situation. It's usually very, very fast. So we usually have this uh, nerve impulse being set along, sent along a dedicated sort of line of neurons <clears throat> to a very specific target. Targets can be other neurons, targets can be muscle cells, targets can be endocrine glands or exocrine glands, and these are very fast acting, but usually short lasting. So these are really good for immediate response to a localized stimulus, like that is hot, <laughs> like if you touch a hot stove, right? You have a very quick reaction to pull your hand away. You know, um, fast acting, short lasting as opposed to, hey, you know, I'm entering puberty and so hormones are gonna change and it happens and comes on very slowly, but it's a much more long lasting thing. So it just really depends, uh, you know, what our body needs. Okay, so we have these two systems, the endocrine system and the nervous system. And both these systems uh, work to maintain what we call homeostasis which uh, is the process of maintaining a stable internal environment, right? In the face of an external environment that fluctuates, right? We walk outside on a 104 degree day and our internal temperature does not skyrocket to 104 degrees. If it did, we would uh, die. So <clears throat> it's important that doesn't happen. So the actions of the endocrine and nervous system help maintain homeostasis through something called feedback control. And this feedback can be negative feedback or positive feedback. And I'll get to the differences between those two in a couple slides. <clears throat> but first, I actually wanna go over a non-living example, which is a thermostat in a house, because it actually is a perfect analogy for exactly what happens in living organisms as well. So let's think about a thermostat. So, and on your thermostat, you decide what temperature uh, you need it to be in your room and we set this and we call this the set point. We'll say okay our set point for our room is 20 degrees. Well you need some kind of structure that's going to be able to determine whether or not you are at your set point. 
This is called the sensor. It measures the room temperature and provides feedback information to the thermostat. The thermostat will um, compare feedback to the set point and then generates a command. So if the feedback our regulatory system gets, our thermostat gets, is that it is too much above the set point, then it will turn on the air conditioner to lower the temperature. If the feedback that we get is that we are too far below the set point and it's too cold, then it will kick on the heat. Another feature of, you know, if you have a good thermostat, um, and is also a feature in biological systems, is something called feed forward information, which is this ability to change the set point, right? So a lot of times we have thermostats that we can set so that, you know, maybe the AC kicks on when we're home, but we change it while we're gone or something like that. Well, our body does the same thing because depending on the time of day, the time of month, even the time of life, uh, we might have a different set point for particular uh, uh, aspects of our uh, internal environment. So let's talk about this negative and positive feedback. So in negative feedback, the change in the controlled variable triggers a response to counteract the initial change. In other words, the change elicits a reaction that reduces the effects of that change. So let's use an example, because that's sort of like what? Um, let's talk about blood sugar. So this is something we maintain by homeostasis. You don't want to have too high of blood sugar. You don't have, want to have too low of blood sugar. So let's say that our blood sugar is high. It exceeds the set point. So in response, what our body does is it promotes the release of insulin. Insulin will stimulate the uptake of glucose from our blood, therefore lowering blood sugar. So this is negative feedback because the change in the controlled variable, right, our blood sugar got too high, that's how the variable changed, triggers a response to counteract this. It triggers a response to insulin to lower that blood sugar back down. The same thing is true if our blood sugar is too low. So let's say our blood sugar is too low. It's too far below the set point. That is the uh, change in the controlled variable. It got too low. Well, this elicits a response that will cause your body to make glucagon. Glucagon stimulates the breakdown of glycogen from our liver. And once that gets broken down, it gets put back into our bloodstream. So we get more sugar put in our bloodstream, so we raise that sugar back up. So even though we're raising our sugar, it's still a negative feedback, right? Because the signal of low blood sugar, we did something to try to counteract that, to reduce the effect of that change. What about positive feedback? So this is when the change in a controlled variable triggers a response to actually enhance the initial change. So in other words, the change from the set point elicits a response that increases the effects of that change. Now, negative feedback is much more common than positive feedback. It's actually pretty rare, but a good example is childbirth. So what's going on in childbirth? Well, what happens is that when you're giving birth, um, the pressure of the head of the baby on the cervix will cause the pituitary gland in the brain, once nerve impulses transmit that information to the brain, it will secrete a hormone called oxytocin. The oxytocin gets carried in the bloodstream to the uterus, and this oxytocin is going to stimulate contractions. And what happens when you have a contraction? It increases the pressure, which will lead to more oxytocin being produced, which causes more contractions, which leads to more oxytocin, more contractions, and this keeps going and going until the baby pops out, basically. Um, so this is positive feedback in that the change in the controlled variable, the increased oxytocin, 
elicits a response that will lead to an increased effect of that change. It, it elicits the response of contractions that's gonna cause more oxytocin. So it creates this cycle that typically is gonna terminate in something, in this case, in the birth of the baby.